But by the time George VI's daughter, Elizabeth, came to the throne, British society had changed dramatically. Refrigerators, cookers and cupboards are all in the latest fashion, clean and... And an increasing desire for greater social equality left the monarchy looking distinctly out of step. This turned into a huge public issue in 1957. John Edward Poinder Grigg, second Baron Orchingham, is in hot water. This 33-year-old peer often expresses views unpopular with his fellow Tories. But now he is under fire from inside and outside his own party. In an article in his journal, The National and English Review, he voices criticisms of the Queen and her court, which roused the wrath of much of the national press. Grigg complained in his article that the Queen was isolated from her subjects and out of touch with contemporary Britain, largely because she was surrounded by people who came exclusively from the upper classes. The trouble about the court is that it's all drawn from one small section of this country. It should be drawn from every country of the Commonwealth and from every section of the community. Grigg didn't mince his words. He described the Queen's speaking manner as a pain in the neck and said her speeches conveyed the personality of a priggish schoolgirl. I name this ship Empress of Britain. May God speed her and all who sail in her. Ooh. Grigg's remarks aroused such hostility that he was even attacked in the street by an irate monarchist. And I, that the Queen was thought to be out of touch with the mainstream of British society was hardly surprising. She and her sister Margaret never went to school because their father couldn't conceive of them mixing with ordinary children. So we find the Princess Elizabeth and her sister Margaret, accompanied by their governesses, enjoying a short trip upriver starting from Bolter's Lock. It was not until she was 18 and allowed to join the volunteer army that the Queen had any contact with contemporaries who were not of her class. When the war ended a few weeks later, she and Margaret had a rare experience of rubbing shoulders with ordinary people on the evening of VE Day. My sister and I realised we couldn't see what the crowds were enjoying, so we asked my parents if we could go out and see for ourselves. I remember we were terrified of being recognised. So I pulled my uniform cap well down over my eyes. We cheered the king and queen on the balcony and then walked miles through the streets. I think it was one of the most memorable nights of my life. But this was only a brief encounter with the outside world. By the 1950s, the queen had returned to a life which was almost totally separate from that of her subjects. But Grigg's criticisms proved to be a turning point. One very leading member of the royal household uh, uh, arranged that we should meet within 48 hours of the thing starting, great row of starting. Um, and uh, his first words to me when we met were, this is the best thing that's happened to Buckingham Palace in my time. I mean, we were both strong monarchists and we both felt that change was needed. Not um, excessive change, but, but significant change. <laughs> To begin with, the monarchy set about changing some of the social events which associated it with privilege and wealth. The practice of presenting debutantes to the Queen, upper-class young girls coming out into society for the first time, was abruptly terminated. And it was also decided to make the traditional garden parties more democratic affairs. In future, a far wider cross-section of society would be invited. Today, three garden parties are held at Buckingham Palace every summer, and over 8,000 people attend each one. Some of them will have been specially selected to meet the Queen. And there's always a chance of a chat with other members of the royal family too. Whilst it may not be a very close encounter with royalty, there's no doubt that garden party invitations are highly appreciated. Well, I think it's an honour, you know, to, to go to the palace in the first place. And the dress and the, the hats and the people, it was just wonderful. I actually wondered what, what it was like to be stared at by all the peasants, you know. <laughs> <laughs> in order to try and gain a greater insight into the lives of her subjects than the garden parties allow, 
The Queen has also introduced the practice of holding informal lunches. But perhaps the most radical innovation of all has been the walkabout, introduced by the Queen in 1970. For the first time ever, unselected members of the public could meet the monarch if they chose to. Gwyn Fitch was in Derby in May. Well, today I've uh, found out that the Queen's <coughs> is going to walk from the recreation uh, centre by coming down a ramp, and uh, it's said that she will do a walkabout. So hopefully, um, with all the flowers that are along these barriers, and my flowers, she'll walk over. And I've also managed uh, to bring with me this time um, a photograph I took last year of Sandringham Gardens. So I'm just hoping um, that I'll get that opportunity to, to hand them to her and tell her about my visit. The far greater accessibility of the monarchy in recent times can be seen from surveys, which show that one in 12 people have met a member of the royal family. Many of them on walkabouts like this one. Your Majesty. Hello, Your Majesty. I'm trying to make you sick. Make them. I wonder if you would accept this picture. I took it of you of your gardens in Sandringham about a year ago, and I thought, well, you very rarely have the chance to see Sandringham. Well, I had a little seed in the summertime. I know, anyway. that's what I thought. And uh, some flowers. It's Thank lovely you. to see that's you. Really Wonderful to see you. Oh, that's very kind. Thank you very much. Your Majesty, delighted to see you. It's wonderful. She's our monarch. And um, for her to take her time to speak to me, it's wonderful. <laughs> I can't believe it. I made it. <laughs> but while in many respects it might be good for the monarchy to become less distant and more ordinary, some of the Queen's subjects would not welcome such a change. If one is going to have a royal family, it's got to be different. There's no point in having a royal family which is not different. If they're going to be different, then they must to some extent stay remote and mysterious and leave you wondering a bit always what is going on behind those palace walls. And given that, I don't think that they can or should come down too far from their pedestal, mix too much with the masses. Nevertheless, during the Queen's reign, British society has changed, and it's argued that the monarchy must reflect this, both for its own sake and for the good of the country as a whole. The main importance of the monarchy today is as a symbol, so it's crucial we should get that symbolism right. The chief problem of the monarchy is that it still embodies the privileged society we once were, rather than the classless society we now aspire to be.